inviting me. So, yeah, I, full disclosure, I, I'm kind of really a nuclear physicist who, has, who pretends to do astrophysics. Um, I started out in nuclear phys physics and migrated over. Um, but I hope uh, the talk today will sort of be equal parts astrophysics and nuclear physics. So I'm going to be talking about um, testing uh, a particular way of making neutron stars um, by using some uh, universal-ish uh, relations between properties of neutron stars, uh, such as moment of inertia uh, and things related to that. Um, I uh, should acknowledge the uh, collaborators uh, that have worked with me on to uh, obtain the results I'm going to show at various points, um, and uh, hopefully the meaning of the uh, magnesium lizard will become a little clearer uh, as we progress. So, uh, let me first start off with some takeaway points, so if you get nothing else from this talk. Um, uh, what I'm going to argue is that uh, uh, so some stars that start their lives in the mass range between 7 and 11 solar masses uh, go supernova not when not they don't wait until their core reaches the, uh, the iron stage they actually collapse at the oxygen neon magnesium stage this is called an electron capture supernova um, this is, at the moment, it's still a hypothesis, um, but establishing whether this happens in nature is very important uh, for population synthesis of stars. It's particularly important in understanding the rate of production of high-mass X-ray binaries and double neutron star systems, uh, and hence uh, you know, gaining more accurate predictions of the rate at which neutron stars merge, which is of interest for them gravitational wave searches. Um, <clears throat> if a system undergoes an electron capture supernova, fairly tight constraints can be placed on some of the more uncertain properties of neutron stars and therefore the properties of dense matter inside of neutron stars. And roughly universal relations between the properties of neutron stars allow the details of this electron capture supernova scenario to be tested uh, if we can measure a neutron star's moment of inertia to within about 10% accuracy. So I'm going to argue these points and uh, argue that, the, that this, this gives us another method to test whether electron capture supernovae actually happen or not. So uh, this is the, uh, the standard picture the standard sort of one slide picture of stellar evolution. Um, low mass stars uh, progress this way, end up as a white dwarf. High mass stars undergo supernovae, which is usually understood to mean the uh, collapse of an iron core, and end up as a neutron star, star or as a black hole. But the, the, the mass boundaries between these different scenarios are quite fuzzy. Um, at the high mass end, we don't quite know where the dividing line is, or if the dividing line is likely quite fuzzy between those stars that produce uh, neutron stars and those that produce black holes somewhere. The cutoff will be somewhere between 20 and 30 solar masses. But uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the, uh, the other boundary. We, we are pretty certain that all stars that start their lives off less than six solar masses form white dwarfs. And we're also fairly sure that those stars that start off their lives with masses of 11 solar masses form neutron stars. But between these masses, both white dwarf and neutron stars could be the result, depending on the evolutionary details of those stars. Okay. And in this mass range, between about six and 10 solar masses, there are as many stars as there are with masses higher than 10 solar masses. So this is a pretty important range of initial masses to, uh, to understand the evolutionary details for. So um, 
ion cores collapse uh, at a variety of core masses. This is a plot of the iron core mass versus the initial mass of the star. Uh, this is the core mass which undergoes collapse. And you can see that over the range of possible uh, initial masses, the core can become unstable at masses from about 1.2 solar masses up to you know, uh, on for two solar masses. And this results in uh, a wide range of possible neutron star masses. Um, simulations tend to show peaks around uh, between 1.2 and 1.4 solar masses and generally a higher mass peak between at about 1.8 or so solar masses. Um, so, the, so iron cores can produce a wide range of neutron star masses. Okay, now there is an alternative to the iron core collapse uh, scenario. Uh, this is the uh, electron capture supernova scenario. What happens is that when the core of the star reaches a pretty precisely defined mass of somewhere between 1.37 and 1.38 solar masses, uh, the oxygen neon magnesium core becomes unstable to electron captures onto uh, neon and magnesium, okay, which is depicted uh, here, not quite as it actually happens, but you see the magnesium blizzard gobbling up the electrons. The electrons are responsible for the pressure of the core, so removing the electrons causes the star to go un unstable and collapse. Um, very rapidly, the, the time scale on, on which these uh, captures occur uh, becomes much less than the time scale on which the core grows due to the deposition of material from the, the carbon and helium burning layers outside. And so the, uh, the oxygen neon magnesium core mass is frozen in this range here. So this is, this is pretty accurately is the, uh, is the mass of the core that collapses. Um, the core starts to collapse, contracts, heats, and uh, triggers oxygen and neon burning. Uh, and material gets processed to nuclear statistical equilibrium and the, car, the, uh, the core collapses, bounces and explodes um, as a supernova. So, uh, the, uh, there are a couple of features of this type of supernova that uh, make them potentially distinguishable from iron core collapse. Um, the time scale on which the collapse occurs is a factor of a few less than the time scale for iron core collapse. And this is down to, mainly down to a very steep density gradient between the core and the envelope. So this is the, the density inside the star as a function of the radius. Uh, the core, so you see there's a drop off of about 10 or more orders of magnitude uh, to the hydrogen envelope, maybe a little less, uh, depending on the initial stellar model. Um, and, uh, and this causes the, uh, initially the shock to expand quickly and the time scale for the explosion uh, happens uh, on times of order 100 milliseconds or so. So this is the, uh, the radius of the shock wave uh, coming out from the bouncing core. And so this, you see, t around 100 milliseconds is where the shock escapes and blows off the outer layers of the star. Um, and we've simulated this scenario in both one dimension and two dimensions. And uh, in 2D, where we can start modeling you know, uh, non spherical symmetric effects, such as convection in the core, um, but we find that the shock actually escapes before convection gets going in the proto-neutron star. And what this means is that there isn't time for large instabilities to develop in the exploding core, which means we're going to end up with a very symmetric supernova explosion 
with low kicks delivered to the, uh, the system, of which it is a part. Um, this uh, is a plot as a function of time of the, uh, the radius of various layers inside the star. So this is for a 1.38 solar mass star. The uh, outer edge of it is, uh, is where the helium layer ends. So you've got the helium layer here in blue. You've got the carbon and oxygen layer begins here, and the oxygen, neon, magnesium layer here. And <clears throat> what this simulation shows is that uh, during the explosion, there is very little mass lost from the collapsing core. So of order 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. Okay, you can see that the mass cut, the mass that ends up collapsing and forming the proto-neutron star, is around 1.363 solar masses. And so you've got about nearly 2 times 10 to the minus 2 solar masses lost, which is this is quite a small amount of material. Um, and this is consistently reproduced in a number of 1D and 2D supernova simulations. So um, the, these facts are going to become very important in a minute. Um, so we should ask what, what stars do we predict go supernova this way? What are the conditions for the uh, electron capture supernova happening? Well. For single stars, there's actually a very, very narrow window of masses of initial stars that end up producing electron capture supernovae. So this is shown in this plot here. So you've got uh, only between you know, about 8.2 and 8.4 solar masses at uh, low metallicities, and the, the mass range increases for higher metallicities. Um, <clears throat> below that, you've got various types of white dwarfs above that you've got an iron core collapse supernova occurring. So you can at most 5% uh, of all core collapse supernovae um, will be due to electron capture supernovae. Um, but this neglects uh, binary evolution, which of course is very important to zeroth order. All stars are binaries, are part of the binary system. Um, and binary evolution is really important because in order to get an electron capture supernova, you need your oxygen, neon, magnesium core to grow to the 1.37, 1.38 solar mass uh, limit, at which it becomes unstable. And what tends to happen in single stars is that uh, can, the dredge up phases, particularly the second dredge up phase, where uh, large-scale convection uh, penetrates the core and, and dredges up core material, uh, that tends to prevent the core reaching the, uh, the mass limit at which it becomes unstable. So in order to prevent that, you need to prevent a large convective envelope developing, which means you need to lose a large amount of the outer envelope of the star. Um, so you need to get rid of the hydrogen envelope and maybe even a lot of the helium before the, the, to be um, sure that the, uh, the core is going to reach uh, the required mass. So in order to do that, you require binary interactions. So let me take you through um, a couple of possible evolutionary scenarios that lead to the production of neutron stars via electron capture supernovae. And both of these scenarios actually result in a double neutron star system um, being produced, which is relevant for uh, what we're going to be looking at in a couple of minutes. Um, so this is the so-called standard channel in which we start with two stars, initial masses around uh, 10 solar masses. The uh, primary is slightly bigger than the secondary. Uh, you, go, you have stable mass transfer uh, from the primary to the secondary star, uh, the, or is it the other way around? The, uh, the prime, yes, and the primary star goes supernova. Uh, you then get unstable mass transfer resulting in a com common envelope phase which ejects 
the hydrogen envelope of the secondary star and leaves you with a neutron star, helium star uh, binary system. Um, so uh, at this stage, the secondary star is, it has the right conditions to evolve and uh, collapse and go supernova as an electron capture supernova. There's a second way of doing this, so the so-called double core channel. If both stars start off with roughly the same mass, then you initially get unstable mass transfer, common envelope, ejection of the, uh, the hydrogen envelope of the secondary star. The first star goes supernova, and you end up again with a helium star, neutron star binary. In both these scenarios, you get further mass transfer from the helium star onto the neutron star, which further depletes the helium envelope of the secondary star, and then that undergoes electron capture supernova. And you end up with a double neutron star system uh, that is, starts off as a, a relatively tight binary. Um, so, uh, these supernovae would account for at least some of type 1b c supernovae having lost its, their hydrogen envelopes and uh, some of their helium. And uh, if you do population synthesis calculations, you can, you can uh, you know, if you tune the parameters favorably, you can get up to 30% of all supernovae exploding as electron captured supernovae. Right? Now, admittedly, this 30% is the high the high limits on that, but uh, it, it illustrates the importance of understanding this mechanism and trying to figure out whether it actually happens in nature. Um, so the establishing the likelihood of this scenario is important in a number of astrophysical contexts. contexts. Uh, we, it will um, it helps constrain the evolutionary history of specific systems, as I'll discuss in a minute, the double pulsar and the crab pulsar both show, uh, both show evidence of being produced this way. Um, it will help us understand better the boundary between producing white dwarf and neutron stars, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, it will help uh, constrain population synthesis models that are important in a number of contexts, um, especially predicting rates of double neutron star mergers. So what evidence do we have at the moment that the, the electron capture supernova mechanism is actually operational in nature? Well, there is some evidence, uh, it's, it's all, as so much of astronomical evidence is, circumstantial, but um, one piece of evidence comes from analyzing the abundance of high-mass X-ray binaries uh, in starburst galaxies. So, for example, uh, it's been observed that there seems to be a, an overabundance of, uh, of, of these high-mass X-ray binaries, particularly uh, B X-ray binaries, in uh, the small Magellanic cloud between um, ages of 20 and 60 uh, mega years. And this is actually predicted if the electron capture supernova mechanism is operational. That enhances the production of these binary systems um, in this age and gives you this electron capture supernova hump in the, uh, the number of these high mass X ray binaries forming. Um, further evidence comes from the fact that the, uh, the B X ray binary population is bimodal in its orbital, in the orbital and neutron star spin periods, which you would expect if one of the, one way to produce these uh, B X-ray binaries was in electron capture supernovae that tend to produce uh, very circular binary orbits and, um, and uh, neutron stars in a particular range of spin period. Um, the, uh, the crab pulsar, the crab supernova remnant, uh, shows some evidence of having been formed in an electron capture supernova. Um, by uh, We can measure the rate at which the nebula is expanding, and we find that there actually seems to be quite low kinetic energy uh, in the ejector. 
suggesting a low energy supernova explosion, which is what an electron capture supernova would be. The mass ejected, if we try and measure the mass in the remnant, it's quite uncertain, but it puts it in a, a mass range which is uh, you know, plausible for a star that started out somewhere between eight and 10 solar masses. And we also find a low yield of nickel 56, which you also expect uh, for the electron capture supernova scenario. Um, and then there is evidence from certain double neutron star systems. And this is what really um, got us interested in this whole, uh, this whole scenario. So it was noticed fairly on that the double pulsar system um, has certain characteristics that, are, that mark it out from other double neutron star systems. It's uh, the, the secondary neutron star mass is very precisely measured, 1.25 solar masses. Has a low, the system has a low orbital eccentricity. The alignment between the spin of the secondary neutron star and the orbital angular momentum of the system is uh, very small. Uh, the transverse velocity of the system is very small. Um, it is located quite uh, close to the, uh, the galactic plane, uh, and the pulse profile of the primary neutron star is very stable. These suggest that the, the supernova that formed the secondary neutron star was very symmetric and delivered a very small kick to the system left the system relatively undisturbed. Um, more recently, this double neutron star system here has shown very, very similar characteristics to the uh, uh, double neutron star system. And if you do population synthesis studies, then they suggest that the most likely formation scenario for both of these systems is an electron capture supernova scenario. So um, let me, uh, I'm going to skip over that just for a moment. So given, if you, if you accept for the moment that uh, pulsar B in the double pulsar system formed an electron capture supernova, um, then we can, do, we can follow the following line of reasoning. So, as I mentioned earlier, when you model these, the, these cores, the oxygen, neon, magnesium cores, we find that they become unstable in a very tight range of masses. So this, this, is, uh, this gives you the full mass range suggested by modeling to date, somewhere between about 1.36 and 1.38 uh, solar masses is when the core becomes unstable. When you model the supernova explosion, you find that very little mass is lost during the formation of the pulsar. Okay. That means that these estimates are actually to within an accuracy of maybe uh, 10 to the minus 2 solar masses, maybe a couple, maybe 2 times 10 to the minus 2. These are estimates of the baryon mass of the resulting pulsar. Now, in the, bi in the double pulsar system, we measure the mass of the uh, pulsar, but what we're measuring is the gravitational mass of the pulsar. So the baryon mass is what you would measure if you disassembled the pulsar uh, you know, neutron by neutron, particle by particle, and weighed the masses individually and added it all up. But what we measure is the gravitational mass, which includes the gravitational binding energy of the pulsar. Um, so if you put these two things together, what we get is an estimate for the gravitational binding energy of the pulsar <coughs> itself, which is you know, the difference between these two masses, which is about 0 0.1, 0 0.12 solar masses. Okay. Which, there's a yeah. planet around it. Which is the mass that you put into the Keplerian mass? If there is, say that again. Well, what, if the planet is orbiting this thing, what is the mass that Oh, sorry, is it M sub B or M sub G? Uh, M sub G. Yeah. Yes. 
gravitational masses that determines all the dynamics, uh, the orbits. Um, okay, so under the assumption of electron capture supernovae, we have a constraint on the binding energy of the pulsar. Okay, so to understand why this is really useful for understanding neutron stars, let me step back a bit and just uh, fill you in on you know, what is a neutron star and what do we know and what don't we know about them. So here's a photo of a neutron star someone took over Vancouver. Um, the, uh, yeah, it, it probably is probably fake because the, the the neutron star here appears very cold given the color. To, to get this low in temperature would take much longer than the age of the universe. So that's how you can tell this is, this is fake. Um, so, so neutron stars are objects. They have masses between one and two solar masses. They're the result of supernova explosions. Their radii are of order 10 kilometers, and <clears throat> the average densities inside a neutron star are of the same order of magnitude as the densities you find in an atomic nucleus, uh, which for a, you know, a, a sort of order of magnitude, a, 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 a number to set your scale by, uh, two point, around 2.5 times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter, roughly, maybe a little higher, is the density inside uh, an atomic nucleus. Um, neutron stars are, are great for throwing lots of fun numbers around. Um, they are, so here's a neutron star this time compared to Manhattan. They are not much bigger than a black hole. Their surface gravity uh, is about half as strong as that of the, uh, the um, event horizon of a black hole. Escape velocity is half the speed of light-ish. Um, uh, they have colossal pressures, colossal surface gravities, um, and particularly relevantly, they have very large gravitational binding energies, as we've seen, that can be of order 0 0.1, 0 0.2 solar masses. Um, so to, uh, uh, I need to define a couple of numbers that will become important in a minute. The, the, the number I showed previously here, we tend to call nuclear saturation density, um, I won't go into the details, this is essentially a rough, uh, uh, roughly the density that you would find inside of most atomic nuclei. Um, nuclear physicists uh, often use a, uh, uh, a density unit of baryons per cubic Fermi, a Fermi is 10 to the minus 15 meters, and so <clears throat> uh, this density corresponds to about 0.16 baryons per you can cram about, uh, what is that, a sixth of a neutron or a proton into a box, one Fermi cubed at this density. Um, the to zeroth order, you can kind of think of your the neutron star structure by picturing a, a slice of pizza. They have a solid crust that is about a kilometer thick and a liquid core that is about 10 kilometers thick. Um, the crust itself is actually very interesting, and I've, uh, uh, a lot of the work I do is in understanding the properties of neutron star crusts, especially the deep layers. Um, so I, I won't go into details now, just to, um, just to mention that the, the crust itself is thought to uh, comprise a crystalline lattice of heavy neutron-rich nuclei. Um, the uh, outer part of the crust consists of just this lattice with uh, a sea of degenerate electrons permeating. Uh, the inner part of the crust uh, exists in a regime where the nuclei have become so large and so neutron rich that the, uh, some of the neutrons become unbound and form a gas of neutrons that permeates the lattice together with the electrons. And that neutron gas itself becomes denser as you go further, deeper into the inner crust. And at some point, the nuclei in the lattice become so close together that it's predicted that they start deforming into long spaghetti-like strands or slabs that we call nuclear pasta. 
Um, and I've done a lot of work trying to simulate the properties of these pasta phases, so I just thought I'd throw in, because they're pretty pictures, uh, throw in some results of some of our simulations into these nuclear pasta phases, starting from the nuclei higher up in the crust to, through to spaghetti, uh, lasagna phases, and so-called nuclear waffle phases, before things turn inside out and you get neutron gas bubbles of the same shapes before you, before the matter completely dissolves into a homogeneous soup of neutrons and protons. Um, deeper into the core of the neutron star, you may get um, exotic phases uh, comprising, um, for example, hyperons, which are, uh, if you take neutrons and protons and start replacing their quarks with uh, strange quarks, then um, you get uh, a whole family of particles that can start appearing there and you may end up dissolving your neutrons and protons entirely into a, uh, a soup of quarks in the center of the neutron star. This is all still very uncertain and uh, we're, part of the reason we like to study neutron stars is to try and understand the properties of dense matter better. So, Neutron stars are a great natural laboratory to, uh, to explore various big questions such as how the strong force, the nuclear forces, manifest in these uh, systems that we can't possibly reproduce in uh, terrestrial laboratories, uh, what phases of matter uh, emerge at these densities. Um, it's also good, they're also good laboratories for testing our fundamental theory of gravity, and uh, relevantly for, for the topic of this seminar, uh, for testing how massive stars die, um, and for exploring what happens next. Neutron stars, it turns out, uh, can lead extraordinarily rich lives and undergo various evolutionary phases of their own. Um, so, the, uh, what, we're, what we're going to be looking at is uh, something that ties together these two questions, the understanding the properties of dense matter and understanding how massive stars die. So, <clears throat> a little bit of basic background on how to model a neutron star. Um, to model any star, you basically need to take the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium that just says the internal pressure in your star balances gravity. And you need an equation of state which relates the pressure in the star to the density, the temperature, the composition of the star. Okay, um, this is the, the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium with the, uh, the terms here in color are the general relativistic corrections that you need to add in when modeling neutron stars, but it's still not that uh, it's, a, it's a relatively simple equation to solve given an equation of state. Uh, but that's where the problem comes in. So in regular stars, you, we, like the sun, we tend to, the equation of state is, is well modeled by an ideal gas type equation of state. Um, at least that's a good starting point. Uh, for white dwarfs, the equation of state is that of a degenerate electron gas, which again, we know very well. But for neutron stars, we do not know the equation of state very well. Okay. And that is because we still have a lot to understand about how neutrons and protons interact uh, at the densities that you find in neutron stars and at the isospin fractions that you find in neutron stars. So the, uh, the high, the very high ratio of neutrons to protons that exists throughout a neutron star, which is much higher than any nuclei that we can subject to experimental tests on Earth. So, to illustrate the uncertainty in the equation of state here is uh, a number of equations of state derived from various models of nuclear interactions. So it's, we, you know, it, don't look too closely at this. The, the main point here is that the models give a very wide range of predictions for the pressure at a given density inside of the neutron star. We've got almost an order of magnitude 
difference here. So different models of nuclear interactions are giving uh, different predictions for the equation of state. When you plug one of these equations of state into the equation of hydrostatic equilibrium and solve it, what you get is for a given neutron star mass, you get a prediction of the radius of that neutron star. Repeat it for different masses, and you build up a mass radius curve for a neutron star like this, which is unique to a particular equation of state. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the equation of state and the mass radius curve. So this uncertainty here translates into an uncertainty in the radius of neutron stars. So one way to try and constrain the equation of state is to measure the neutron star radius, and there is uh, a lot of effort being devoted to that right now. It's very difficult because neutron stars are very small and very far away. Um, so, uh, and we'd, what we'd like is to find other ways of constraining the equation of state that are complementary <coughs> to radius measurements. So this is where uh, obtaining a constraint on the binding energy of a neutron star comes in very handy. So we, um, once we realized that we could get a constraint on the binding energy of pulsar B of the double pulsar under the assumption of electron capture supernova, then we, we calculated the binding energy for a whole range of equation of state models, uh, and the results are plotted here. So these are four plots for uh, essentially showing the predictions of four different classes of equations of state the details of which are not important. Um, this is the gravitational mass, that's the mass that we measure, versus the baryon mass, which is the mass that we infer under the assumption of the electron capture supernova scenario. Um, the, each line is the sort of mass rate, it's the equivalent of the mass radius curve for mass baryon mass, in mass baryon mass space. So these are the theoretical predictions from the equations of state. The box here is the uh, constraint that we have from the measured gravitational mass of pulsar B, which gives you the height of the box, and the modeling that we did to uh, determine the mass at which the oxygen neon magnesium core becomes unstable to collapse, taking into account mass loss from the core during the supernova explosion as well. So we can say, okay, we, you know, if under this scenario, we demand that equations of state have to pass through this box. So that places a constraint on equations of state. But, um, uh, but one question is, well, so what, you know, what determines whether an equation of state passes through this box or not? What's the physics behind that? Um, can we be more systematic about classifying these equations of state? And the answer is yes. Um, but uh, in order to understand that, I need to introduce a, uh, uh, another property of nuclear matter, the type of matter that, that uh, approximates the interior of neutron stars. So, uh, and to to introduce that, let's, let's step back again and ask why is the equation of state so uncertain? Why do we have so many models of the nuclear interaction? Right? We have a good theory for the strong force, like quantum chromodynamics. Well, so this is a, the chart of the nucleides, proton number versus neutron number. Um, the nuclear physicist's periodic table. And uh, we can represent this as, uh, for my purposes, it's better to actually represent this on a logarithmic scale here, okay? So down here we have, uh, some, uh, we have quarks, the region of quarks below a neutron number and a proton number of one. This is where we can apply QCD we can understand the properties of quarks, and we can understand the properties of matter generally at high energies. The problem is that QCD is 
um, becomes non-perturbative at low energies, and low energies is the regime of nuclei, neutrons and protons. So it is currently, uh, computation, computationally, it is prohibitively expensive to simulate anything more than the very lightest uh, nucleon systems using QCD. So we certainly can't model, say, lead 208 um, from first principles. So what we have to do is we have to develop effective theories for the nuclear force in order to model the nuclei that we see around us in nature. Um, and there are a, a number of different ways of building effective models for nuclear interactions. And they all tend to come with a number of free parameters that you have to fit to data, to nuclear data. Okay. So we can do that, and you, know, you can take your favorite model of the interactions, fit it to data, and you can usually get decent uh, descriptions of large portions of the, uh, the chart of the nucleides, the properties of nuclei. Um, but the thing is, what we're asking them, these models, to do is we are asking them to be extrapolated uh, from here up to here, up 10 to the 50-odd orders of magnitude in neutron number and proton number. Um, and, uh, and even more importantly than that, um, we are extrapolating from nuclei which have roughly equal numbers of neutrons and protons to a system like a neutron star, which you know, throughout its core contains a border 90% neutrons, 10% protons. So this is a regime of nuclear matter that we cannot probe directly on Earth. Um, so because we're asking our models to extrapolate so far, it's not a surprise that they start giving uh, diverging predictions on the properties of neutron stars. Um, so this is, this is neutron star matter um, that we're trying to model. And a useful concept to introduce is that of the symmetry energy. So this, what we have here is a phase diagram of uh, of nuclear matter. So nuclear matter is a, it's a theoretical abstraction. It's, it's, we imagine a system of neutrons and protons. There's a certain ratio of neutrons and protons to protons and a certain density. Um, we assume we neglect uh, electrostatic interactions between protons. So this is a purely nuclear system. And this, this is kind of a test a theoretical test bed for our nuclear models. And it is a, an approxi a good approximation to neutron star matter. To, to get neutron star matter, you just have to add back in the contributions from the Coulomb interaction and add in a few electrons, and you're there. But theoretically, you can ask, well, what is the phase diagram for nuclear matter? Right? So this is what that looks like. So this is uh, the phase diagram as a function of temperature, and uh, essentially you can read the horizontal axis as density. Right? So this is increasing density. Um, in this corner of the diagram here, we have hadronic matter, we have neutrons and protons. Uh, they, uh, in a very uh, limited density regime, we have the, uh, the region occupied by terrestrial nuclei. Um, and down here, in this corner, we have the uh, region of parameter space occupied by neutron stars. Um, so these are low temperature systems. Okay? We can probe nuclear matter by smashing together uh, heavy nuclei, which we do at various facilities, including here. And, uh, and that tends to probe nuclear matter up here at higher temperatures. And but we can reach densities um, around nuclear density and maybe a factor of two or three higher. So we can begin to indirectly get a handle on how nuclear interactions work at the higher densities 
that we see in neutron stars. And then at some point, there is a transition, a phase boundary uh, beyond which you get a transition to quark gluon plasma. And we, the various exotic phases of quark, phases of quark matter here that may be manifest in neutron stars. I don't have time to go into it now. Um, this, so this is a, this is a, a commonly uh, shown diagram, but it neglects uh, one important axis, and that is so-called isospin asymmetry. So this uh, isospin asymmetry is simply another way of expressing the fraction of protons that we have in our system. So if x is our proton fraction, then the isospin asymmetry parameter delta here is just defined as 1 minus 2x. So, in other words, if you have equal numbers of protons and neutrons, uh, proton fraction is a half, and isospin asymmetry is zero. If you have pure neutron matter, proton fraction is zero, isospin asymmetry is one. So this is a parameter that goes from zero to one as you go from isospin symmetry, where most terrestrial nuclei are, to pure neutron matter, which neutron stars closely approach. Um, and so neutron stars are actually sort of over here in this diagram, okay, at, at, in the region of high isospin asymmetry. Now, you can use nuclear models to calculate the uh, energy per particle or energy density of nuclear matter. And if you, uh, if you take symmetric nuclear matter, so if you at, at low temperatures, if you calculate the energy as you increase the density for proton fractions of roughly a half, then you get a curve that looks like this. Okay, so it decreases with density, reaches a minimum, and then starts to increase, and will start increasing up here like this. And this minimum in energy here is at around nuclear saturation density, the density you find in heavy nuclei. That's why nuclei tend to sit at that density, because that's where the energy minimum is. Um, as you move uh, this way from uh, towards more isospin asymmetric matter, then the energy per particle starts increasing, and at isospin asymmetries that are more representative of neutron stars, the minimum disappears and it just increases uh, monotonically with density like this. Um, the symmetry energy is simply, or one simple definition of it, is simply the difference in energy between the energy of pure neutron matter and the energy of so-called symmetric nuclear matter, equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Um, we, have, we have pretty good constraints on the energy of symmetric nuclear matter, especially around nuclear saturation density, because that's where all of our experimental data is taken. Um, so we know this pretty well, at least within this density region here. But when we extrapolate up here, our models give quite divergent results. So when you take the difference between the two to get the symmetry energy, then what you end up with is this whole mess of predictions here. So the, a lot of the uncertainty in the neut neutron star equation of state stems from the uncertainty in the symmetry energy itself. And you can relate this simply, quite, quite simply to certain global properties of neutron stars. So the, the symmetry energy itself, is, I, I uh, call it um, just uh, the symmetry energy S as a function of density or baryon density n. You can expand this, uh, this function about nuclear saturation density uh, in a Taylor series, and the first term is just the magnitude of the symmetry energy at saturation density, and the second term, uh, the parameter uh, in the second term is the, what we call the slope of the symmetry energy, right, which is just the gradient of the, uh, this, of these whatever curve you pick here, at saturation density. And the pressure inside a neutron star at nuclear saturation density 
is to first order proportional to the slope of the symmetry energy here. Okay. So, and the and the pressure, and this this is a you know this is a good um, approximation to the average pressure inside of a neutron star. And the average pressure correlates strongly with the radius of a neutron star. Okay. So um, higher pressure, you're going to end up with a higher, a larger star. And so the radius and the certain global properties of neutron stars are directly related to the slope of the symmetry energy at densities close to, to nuclear saturation density. So because of the importance of the, the symmetry energy uh, to neutron star properties, there's been a lot of effort in the last decade or two trying to measure these parameters in the laboratory and infer them from astrophysical measurements. Um, so again, I won't go into detail here. This is a plot of the slope of the symmetry energy versus the magnitude of the symmetry energy at saturation density. And this is, uh, this is um, a whole bunch of experimental and astrophysical inferences of these two parameters from a variety of nuclear experiments, including heavy ion collisions, um, measurements of the neutron skin of uh, neutron-rich nuclei, okay, the so lead 208, um, because it, it has uh, about 40 more neutrons than protons, the neutrons actually extend out further than the protons, so there's a skin of neutrons, and if you can measure the thickness of that skin, that is uh, correlated strongly with the slope of the symmetry energy. Uh, and because it correlates with the radius, you can attempt to extract uh, the slope of the symmetry energy from radius measurements, and there are other astrophysical probes, uh, neutron star probes, that we can employ. So, um, so what we did uh, a few years ago is we asked whether uh, we can, uh, or how strongly the slope of the symmetry energy is correlated with the binding energy of neutron stars to see if we can link it with this constraint from the electron capture supernova scenario. Um, so this is a plot of a whole of the prediction for this parameter L for a whole bunch of equations of state versus the baryon mass of a 1.25 solar mass or gravitational mass neutron star. Um, so there is a, you know, a, a rough correlation here, a rough relation between the two parameters. If you plot on the, uh, the experimental constraints that I showed in the previous diagram, this is, um, these are just two of those experimental constraints. The wider region is, is what we took to be the most conservative range for L, given the experimental evidence uh, as of since 2009. Um, so that constrains L to be within this region here. Um, this, this is the result of uh, one uh, measurement um, or inference from heavy ion collisions. And then you can plot on here some vertical bands corresponding to constraints from this electron capture supernova scenario, which remember places constraints on the baryon mass of the, uh, of the neutron star. And so, uh, so what you want to demand is that your, uh, your equations of state fall within a region uh, that is covered both by experiment and the astrophysical modeling. So somewhere in this region here. So that, uh, you know, that doesn't give a particularly strong constraint at the moment. Um, it seems, looking at the range of equations of state here, it seems to favor uh, symmetry energies with slopes of less than 70 MeV. Okay. MeV is the unit that we use for this particular parameter. So we, we can extract some constraint on the slope of the symmetry energy here. But we can also turn this around. We can say that um, if down the road the experiment measures the slope of the symmetry energy to say be um, uh, say 100 MeV, okay, 
then that is inconsistent with uh, the predictions from the astrophysical modeling, and therefore we can rule out the electron capture supernova scenario as a, uh, as a way to produce pulsar B. Um, okay, and then finally, I'm almost, uh, almost done. The final step we've taken with this analysis um, is to bring in a, a, recent, uh, a recent development in looking at the relationships between various neutron star properties, uh, the so-called I love Q relations. Um, so it was about three years ago, it was found that the moment of inert, if you, if you uh, plot the predictions from a whole bunch of equations of state, for the moment of inertia of neutron stars, the love number of neutron stars, which is uh, otherwise known as the tidal deformability of neutron stars. So that is, uh, if you, uh, um, that is how easy it is to deform a neutron star in an external gravitational field. Okay, so that's relevant when you get two inspiraling neutron stars just prior to merger. And Q is the quadrupole, the mass quadrupole moment of a neutron star. So if you plot, uh, say, moment of inertia versus love number or quadrupole moment versus love number, you find that you get an incredibly uh, strong relation between these two quantities that seems independent of the equation of state to within accuracies of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. Um, and we believe this is uh, because you can, neutron stars are matter's last stand against gravity, right? It's, it's the last step before a black hole. And we know that black holes, we believe black holes uh, obey the, the no hair theorem that they can be described by three parameters only. Uh, and, but, and so it's independent of the matter that collapsed to form a black hole. The neutron stars are made of matter, and a lot of their properties depend on the messy details. But the question is, how do you go from one regime to another? And we think that these universal relations are a manifestation of that transition. Um, now, it turns out that an almost but not quite universal relation also exists between these quantities and the binding energy of a neutron star. So um, what we decided to explore was if for example, you manage to measure the moment of inertia of a neutron star, how strong a constraint would that place on its binding energy? Okay. This is relevant because pulsar A of the double pulsar is expected uh, to yield a measurement of the moment of inertia within the next decade, uh, assuming uh, continued timing of that pulsar, and assuming that we can use planned uh, radio facilities, especially the uh, square kilometer array. Um, so this is a measurement of the, uh, the accuracy with which we might be able to measure this certain um, relativistic orbital effect, the, uh, uh, the periastron advance of uh, pulsar A's orbit, which, from which you can extract a measurement of the moment of inertia. So we think we can get it to within 10% in the next decade. So what we did is we, uh, we decided to try and model the equation of state of neutron stars as generally as we possibly could, okay, with as few assumptions about the underlying uh, nuclear interactions uh, as we could get away with to try and make the results as general as possible. Uh, and we end up with the following plot, which will be my bottom line. This is the, I'll <clears throat> skip to the conclusion after this. So. Um, the, uh, we, we approached it in two different ways. The, the main thing to focus on are these, uh, this red, uh, the red density plot here. Okay, so this is from a, uh, a Monte Carlo analysis where we, we started off with modeling the equation of state with a few parameters uh, that could generate in principle equations of state that generated all possible model predictions. We randomly sampled them in the Monte Carlo uh, simulation. 
and uh, you, assuming uniform priors for all the parameters. And then this is the, uh, uh, this, den these, uh, this density plot is what results with the, uh, the brightest color being where the most equations of state fall in the plot. And the, uh, the black contour here, the solid contour, is the 95%. Uh, sorry, it's the, uh, sorry the, dash, the dotted line is the 95%. Uh, confidence interval. So 95% of our equations of state fall, fall in this range here. Um, this is the binding energy versus moment of inertia. So the limits on the binding energy from our electron capture supernova modeling uh, place the binding energy in this range here. Okay. This is just some hypothetical 10% moment of inertia measurement. So, um, so if we measure the moment of inertia in this range here, then this, you know, you'd want to intersect with the predictions from the astrophysical modeling, for example. So if it turned out that the moment of inertia was in this range here, this would rule out the electron capture supernova as an origin for pulsar B. Um, so now, of course, it could be over here, in which case um, it doesn't tell us that much more. But in principle, uh, at least there is there is some way that we could actually rule out this scenario, which is which is a big step forward, I think. Um, okay, let me uh, skip to the conclusions. So, <clears throat> the uh, to understand whether elect electron capture supernova happen is very important for a number of astrophysical scenarios, and the current astrophysical modeling predicts that. These supernova happen when the core reaches a very precise range of mass, and it predicts very little mass is lost in the supernova explosion. These double neutron star systems are compatible with being produced this way, and we've shown that measurements of the moment of inertia of a neutron star can produce independent constraints on the binding energy that can be compared with constraints from the electron capture supernova modeling and potentially rule out that scenario. Um, I think the, the most progress that needs to be made at this point is on the modeling front. Okay, we, we really need to be certain of you know, how tight this mass range is. And really, it, it, the full, I don't think the full extent of parameter space has been explored yet. And also, uh, we need to be sure, you know, we need to understand how, what's the, the absolute upper limit of mass loss that we can get from the supernova to really put, uh, to uh, understand the limits of the prediction for the binding energy. Um, okay, I'll be there. Thank you.